So, Berto, I thought we would read some patron emails and answer them. What do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, and I'm also a professor. Who are you, Umberto? My name is Umberto Casanilla, and I am a purveyor of used gum. Patron Simone from New York says, Hi, Dr. Kirk and Umberto. I found myself particularly enjoying the part of your toxic masculinity episode where you and Umberto were listing examples of characters who displayed toxic masculinity traits and those, oh, who, yeah. al- and those who also displayed positive masculinity traits. I was curious to know if you both had any examples of characters who showed both. One of my favorite characters is the character... One of my favorites along these lines is the character Steve from Stranger Things. At first, he is toxic masculine in that he puts on a persona of being stereotypical as a cool kid in a high school in the 80s, a show-off athlete, a bully, and one who dismisses his girlfriend's needs and concerns. But eventually, he comes to realize that doing so wasn't worth the damage he was causing. Over the course of the show, he then picks up a lot of great qualities, like putting himself in harm's way to save others, prioritizing his girlfriend's happiness, even if that meant letting her go, and even taking on the role like uh, watching over other kids that would not be considered masculine, I w- a toxic masculine. I would love to hear any other examples you can think of along these lines. So, uh, Berto, I didn't give you a chance to prep for this, so I'm kind of springing this on you, but I-, I took a couple minutes to think about some. But before doing that, I just want to review the toxic versus positive masculine characters that we identified. I don't know if you can remember them off the top of your head, but for me, the toxic masculine characters that I listed um, in order from uh, like the most to like one through five. Number one was the Fonz. I thought he was, especially in the first couple seasons, like just quintessential toxic masculine, (laughs) violent, (laughs) always has a silent, cute, always two girls at least two girls on you know one on each arm that they never talk they're they're just completely just objects for him to look cool (laughs) he could do anything he never apologized you know it was just a a a cartoon of a man uh two tony soprano biff from uh from back to the future dennis reynolds from it's always sunny and the mandalorian who is stoic and you know, but actually, sure. Mandalorian is a good example of someone of who both, was yeah. toxic and then became positive. The positive my, oh, okay. characters were Superman, or g- give your give your toxic. Yeah, my five toxic were Biff Tannen, so that one we have in common. Patrick Bateman, Tywin Lannister. Tywin is the the dad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I always get Ty, Tywin and Tyron. Tyrion. Confused. Tyrion. Yeah. See, I don't even know the names. Tywin. Baron Harkonnen, <laughs> uh, and certainly his kids, <laughs> probably the Sting character most of all. But yeah. um, and then Chad um, from um, your uh, in the Company of Men. I guess you could consider Rick to be a toxic masculine as well. Um, oh yeah, that's that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, season four is. Every episode is genius. <laughs> I mean, it took a while for yeah. me to oh, get Oh, you're not at show. five yet, right? You're on four, four right now? Yeah, I think so. We should I'm watch in, five together, man. Okay. I'm in this season. I think I just watched the episode where Rick uh, uh, discloses that he goes to a planet that he designed just so that he can poop in peace. <laughs> yes, yes. And then he finds out that some <laughs> rando is like pooping going on, his, there. on his toilet. Uh, um, and there's this moment where he's just like, Look at you, alone. Or he creates. He well. Anyway, we'll go to that <laughs> rat hole, <laughs> rabbit hole. But uh, positive masculine characters. I got Superman, Sh- Sean from Goodwill Hunting, played by Robin Williams, Aragorn, Henry Fonda's character in Twelve Angry Men, and Chiron from Moonlight. Who are your positive masculine characters? Yeah, I've got Rocky Balboa, the original Rocky. You think what? He's just like punching people's faces. I know, but. He, he, he was a very positive uh, male as well. Um, Gomez from The Addams Family. Mm, the Bill Cosby character in The Bill Cosby Show, <laughs> to be clear. Uh, Mr. Rogers and Superman. So toxic, then positive. The few I could come up with off the top of my head were... I just looked at my IMDb ratings. I, you know, it shows a history of mm-hmm. the movies that I've rated recently. And 
I thought that Power of the Dog, the Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch character, you haven't seen that yet, right? I haven't. Well, you know, our Oscar uh, party is coming up, and so is that you, better you, you catch up. Better watch. I'm, I'm guessing that that'll be on the list. <laughs> I didn't like it. I thought it was. I mean, you know, beautifully shot, beautiful, mm. wonderfully acted, interesting setting, totally boring story, and the quote unquote twist at the end. I found. I didn't. I wasn't a twist. It was. It just. It was plot. It. I think it was so devoid of anything interesting happening that something interesting happens in the last like ten minutes that makes you think of it as a twist when it's just mm-hmm. that's what stories do. They have things that happen anyway. Power of the Dog. Benedict Cumberbatch's character starts starts off as like just quintessential toxic masculine, uh, constantly asserting his manliness, trying to put down a, a, a guy who comes across as less traditionally masculine. And then by the end of the movie, he is uh, being nice and he is taking this guy out to the wilderness to help him learn things. And, you know, he's, he's showing, you know, he's, he goes from being the toxic vers- version of a man to a more positive version of a man. He doesn't turn into a woman, <laughs> you know what I mean? He turns into... Yeah. Uh, a different uh, set of characteristics that we would associate with masculinity that are positive. Uh, Pig, you haven't seen that movie either, the Nicolas no, Cage movie. The Nick Cage character starts off as like extremely isolated and doesn't ha- want to talk to any humans. And when he interacts with humans, he's very, you know, matter of fact and put he puts people off. And he's, but by the end of the movie, he. I mean, he's emerging out of that state to a place where he's more open to helping others and integrating with others. And the, but the one that I thought, and I actually rewatched this movie recently, was Enemy Mine, Dennis Quaid. Oh yeah, uh, he starts off as this, you know, hot shot, think Top Gun space mm-hmm. pilot who all aliens are bad. Yeah, he's he's racist, and he crashes on a planet with one of his enemies, one of his enemy mine, if you will, and they at first are trying to kill each other, but then eventually they have to work together. And his, spoiler alert, the friend of this, this alien friend of his, they're, they're on this planet for years trying to survive. And they become obviously best friends. And then the, his friend, the alien, becomes pregnant because they, they just, they don't get pregnant through sex. They just they just butt off a part of themselves that becomes a child, if I remember right. And then the alien dies, and then he has to take care of this kid. Anyway, the it's you know it just seems like I guess you could say going from a more limited toxic version of masculinity to a more broad positive version. Berto, can you yeah. think of any off the top of my head? I'm sorry I didn't give you time to think. Yeah. About that. Um. So in Mad Men, mm-hmm. uh, what's the, what's the main guy's name? I forget. Uh, the main guy, Madman. So he is someone, and, and actually I'm thinking about it not so much that starts off as negative uh, masculine and p- goes to positive. I was thinking, because I, I kind of understood the question, but her examples were actually more the what, what you just did. But I was thinking maybe characters that had elements of both, and I think, I guess it probably applies in both ways. So that's a character who is has got a lot of toxic masculine aspects, especially because of the time, the era that it takes place. But he also has a lot of interesting positive uh, traits uh, as a male leader in his in his team and his company um, in the industry, and uh, so so I kind of I think that that's interesting. There's a dichotomy of that character. Another one that is interesting as well is Batman. Actually, we mentioned Superman, but Batman has that. First of all, there's literally the the split, but you could say that his Bruce Wayne persona is fake, uh, especially in a movie like The Dark Knight and all that stuff where uh, Christian Bale's, the way he plays it is literally supposed to be like he's putting on a playboy act to kind of hide his true identity, which is Batman. Right. That Um, seems like a retcon, right? (laughs) To make him more likable as a character. But in reality, it's like he's got both. He, He really is literally a kind of a billionaire, you know, tycoon who is a playboy by day. And then by night he fights crime and you know all these things. But even his superhero ness, even if you just look at Batman, Batman's got both. It's like, oh, I, I'm just so tough and I'm gonna punish, but you know, I'm not gonna kill anyone, and I'm gonna try to teach people a lesson. 
and I'm going to take Robin under my wing. And, you know, like <laughs> there's all these uh, things like that. And you could say the same thing about uh, Iron Man, Tony Stark. You know, he's got a lot of uh, both, too. You know, like he's a good leader. He, he like kind of mentors people and he tries to, you know, set a really good example. And he's also got a lot of toxic masculinity. Yeah. So I think you can find a lot, probably in a lot of superheroes. Right. Patron Leah says, Dr. Kirk and Umberto, thank you for the episode on Invisible Loyalties. So just jamming in here, we recorded an episode on Invisible Loyalties, I'm thinking eight years ago, wow. if I'm not mistaken. It was a long time ago. So I, I, maybe five years ago. I'm not sure. Leah listened to that. Or Leah. I never know how to pronounce it. Because it, it's Leah, sometimes Leah, Leah, sometimes it's Leah, sometimes Leah. it's Leah. <laughs> Um, it was uh, it was a rich conversation and made me think about children who grow up without one of their biological parents and that side of the family, without one entire side of their heritage, ancestor, and culture, uh, ancestry and culture, et cetera. So just chiming in here. So basically, invisible loyalty is the core idea, and it's more complicated than this, but the core idea is that we are, as children, inherently loyal to our parents because we consider them to be our caregivers, our guides, our uh, safety net when we need our cheerleading squad, our support system, and that, as it should be, right? All, parent, all kids should look to their parents as this helpful, very helpful human being, right, in their life. And thus, as children, we become loyal to those individuals because we believe that if we are loyal, we'll continue to get those positive things and we respect our parents under good circumstances to such an extent that we just want to be like them we just right. think you know we want to move like them and talk like i mean that you could argue that's why according to this model we learn how to speak the languages that we speak from our parents is because we just mimic them you know there's a lot of mimicry that children will do um, for their parents yep. and so there are some overt loyalties that we could identify like my dad watched a lot of sports growing up. I watched a lot of sports growing up, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, your dad did not watch a lot of sports growing <laughs> up and you did not I watch did a lot not. of sports. Hmm. Coincidence? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but there are invisible loyalties that when we are stressed regarding our attachment with our caregivers, we will sometimes strive so hard to get their love and attention that we will try to be like them in all ways, even in ways we don't really want to be like them. So if our parents were abusive, we might actually have this unconscious motivation to be abusive in the effort of gaining love and approval from the person that we were always trying to get approval from. Wow. And this can uh, make, according to this model by Naj, us be extremely problematic in our relationships throughout our lives always invisibly to us, invisibly meaning subconscious to us, uh, trying to get the love from our parent by just like a three-year-old striving to mimic one's parent. Does that make sense, Bruno? Wow, yeah, yeah. So with this, what Leah is saying is, or Leah is saying is that, well, what if you grew up without connection with one of your parents? Like you just didn't have any, you didn't have much contact with them. Uh, how does it, how do invisible loyalties play into that? So uh, she goes on. It has been a life experience of mine, and I would be curious. So being cut off from one side of the family, yeah, one's, yeah. And I would be curious to hear how Naj's theory would apply to this lived experience. The invisible loyalties of missing parent and culture. How would they perhaps show up? So Berto, you know, you kind of uh, for a good portion of your life grew up without your mom but you were in That's contact right. with your mom's family right yeah and occasion you know like i would see her every maybe every couple of years your mom yeah yeah so but you you i mean i think generally speaking you have grown up i, I think i'll just speak from my perspective on how i think we could talk about this and 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 maybe you could relate to this as, along these lines is that for me you know, I grew up in white America and in a, you know, suburban slash rural area just outside Seattle and had 
very little contact with Japanese culture. I would have these brief moments where I would see my grandparents, you know, and they were intense, and I certainly learned a lot. My dad, Japanese father, uh, would infuse a lot of Japanese culture, early Japanese American culture, into our family. But I did feel and have felt cut off from my Japanese culture in a lot of ways. You know, Japan is so different from the United States. It's just such a yeah. different place in the culture and the the family life and the assumptions and the history. And there, it was just, you know, uh, halfway across the world, across the Pacific Ocean. And, and I would occasionally get glimpses of that. And, and I, I could talk about this for hours. And I think I've talked about this before, that when I got into my 20s and Netflix started to become a thing or 30s or whenever it was, and I started to reach out, you know, really cultivate or try to curate what I was watching. And one of the things that I, f I found I was watching a lot of was Asian movies like oh, Kurosawa or um, uh, Chow Yun Fat movies. And I felt in that moment that even though my ancestors came over 120 years ago, I felt like in my bones, you know, deep in, not like a spiritual thing, but like passed down to me, like kind of subtly through my dad. It, it the, the way that I think about it, it's like, you know, when you have a copy of a copy of a copy of something like a yep. JPEG or a MP3 or a, a audio or a cassette telomere. recording. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, you know, the copy, copy, copy ends up being, really muted, right? It's mm -hmm. hard to distinguish the edges. It becomes kind of de-resolutioned, if you will. Yeah. And I feel like with my own Japanese-ness, I had a de-resolutioned version mm. of it by the time it got like to Like you had me. heard things, seen things, but they were filtered, filtered, filtered. Yeah. And I'm not, and I'm not talking about like, you know, the, like I grew up eating gohan or rice constantly. So that's a pretty unfiltered aspect but little thing you know personality quirks attitudes yeah. what's good in life why are we on this planet you know how do we see ourselves i think that is deeply cultural and changes over time and i i feel like i got like this subtle version and i and of course it was never explicitly told to me it's not like my dad said by the way i'm about to give you a very de-resolution version of Japanese culture <laughs> as I parent you today. You know, it was very subtle. and I mean, it was subtle and not so subtle because my dad grew up in an all Japanese family with a lot of Japanese friends and a Japanese church. You know, I think my dad had mm -hmm. a very Japanese American experience. But anyway, so when I would watch these movies, I felt something was touched in me deeply. Like it was, mm. it was what, you know, because John Woo movies, Italian fat movies, these are just shoot 'em ups. You know, these are ridiculous. Yeah. Double piss, double fisting your <laughs> nine millimeters at the camera while doves are flying in the background, and <laughs> and he's mowing down people. There's there's blood spurting. You know, this isn't high art, but somehow for me, it just it affected me somehow. And uh -huh. I don't know if I was just making it up or something, but I remember thinking, oh, I feel like I'm. This is me. You know, like when I went to Japan. I remember feeling this way as too. I just felt like I'm home, you know, this oh, there's, wow. there's something about it, even though I was treated very much like a foreigner and an outsider. And I've, and I've felt very much like an outsider, you know, I'm fourth generation. So I go mm -hmm. to Japan pretty much like any other non-Japanese person would just, just like, my God, what is happening here? But so I feel like in terms of the invisible loyalty question that patron Leah has is that, I think that if you had, say, a parent that you didn't have contact with and you kind of knew that they were this way or that, but you weren't really, you didn't have contact with them or you heard little things or there were subtle messages given to you about who that parent was, I could absolutely imagine there being like an emerging connection and then the shadow side to that of being invisibly loyal in a way that is perhaps unhelpful to one's personality. Do you know what I'm saying, Berto? Yeah, I mean, that. I can directly relate to that about my mom in that there are, so I've talked about this before, so the idea of how does one show that one loves someone else? 
And the implicit message that I was receiving was that, okay, so let's see, my mom sends money and kind of buys me clothes and sends them. And like, there's some financial support here. And that must mean she loves me. You know, that is how she shows that she loves me. Uh, I never said that literally, right? I never even thought that. But, you know, years go by and then I kind of grow up and I started doing that. And, and then I realized through therapy, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I spend money on people, even strangers, because I'm trying to show them that I care, that I love them or that I want them in my life or whatever, you know? And where did I get that from? <laughs> and when I looked around, it was, it was not clear at first but then i was like well i mean that's kind of how i felt with my not only my mom but that side of the family like oh i see they are there financially now in in reality i had close connections with my uncle and my grandma and stuff like that but there was this aspect of like right right they they provide financial support for me and that shows that i am loved and it's i got interesting that, that i would enact that yeah it's interesting that for you you never, I mean, your issues with money were varied. You know, you were a shopaholic oh, yeah. and, and, <laughs> uh, and someone who would obsess about buying things. And you had a, you had a complex around uh, internally, I'm going to show this person by buying everything in the store and showing them that I can afford it because right. I don't want them thinking like I'm some sort of schmuck who can't afford things, you know. And the flip side, when I'm at the bar uh, you know, let's the, the W hotel or something. And I'm like, everyone's drinks are on me, including yeah. you strangers who I've never met or just met just now. Right. So the W hotel lounge, it wasn't a gigantic bar, but it wouldn't be uncommon to have like 30 people standing around. The, so when you did that, how many times did you do that? I, no, I mean there, I didn't do it that many times because oh. it would have been ridiculously expensive, but I would, I like, and it wasn't necessarily the hold it, but I'd be like, Oh yeah. Hey, get these people. Their drinks are on me or whatever, you know? And I easily get a thing for several hundred dollars that I didn't right. spend, you know? <laughs> and, and, and yet you, even though you're, as you say, you learned the subtle lesson that love is communicated through money and gifts. You never really expect people to give you money and gifts, you know, right. like you're, you're never upset if someone doesn't give you a gift or right. if someone doesn't give you money. It's, it, you never get upset about that. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's You think it's, You think you would have been socialized to kind of accept or expect, expect that, that and also to see that, to see the absence of that as maybe lack of love. But, well, but so you just, I you, think... you internalized the mom, but not the you in that equation. Because I ended up actually wanting the other stuff. Like, well, you can get me money if you want, but how about we spend some time and watch a show or play some Age of Empires or, right. you know? <laughs> so, so the idea is that you might have been, you were loyal to your mom because you wanted her to love you. And as an adult, we're continuing to have that desire because it was an an unmet need fully. So you invisibly or subconsciously became like her in an, in a, you know, uh, an attempt to get her to love you. Cause you're like, look at me, I'm just like you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, and even though she's definitely not at all like that with normal people, like, you know, she doesn't, she would never be the person at the bar or restaurant or whatever. Like, yeah, hey, it's all on me. She's very judicious with her money. She's very, conservative with their money all these things so it was just a weird mental misinterpretation of things like oh i see the provider that is how i am loved i am provided for yeah do you have any remnants of that um a little bit I, well in that i really do enjoy gifting things to people yeah but i don't feel so bad about that now because i don't do it to strangers really um so like at christmas i really really get off on you know like oh what can i get my brother my mom my my family you know like um that makes me happy you know and yeah um that i think that's that part's healthy but it's just yeah. the the aspect that i no longer have seen in myself in the last maybe certainly the last decade 
certainly the last five years, but it's that one of like compulsively wanting to pay for other people who are not even close to me. Right. You know? Yeah. Or just, you know, cause you even, we've talked about how when you met me, I was already starting to do work in this regard. Like if you had met me two years prior, I would have been always paying for everything. And then you met me right as I was trying to like ease myself away from that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we get real for a second? Yeah. So one, you are a very good gift giver in that you are enthusiastic, you're thoughtful, you think about it, you know, usually in advance. However, uh, there was this one, we, we, before, before we started, or no, we just started, we just talked about Rick and Morty. So there was this, I don't know, this is a few years ago and, and it was my birthday coming up or something. And I, I never expect anyone to get me anything. And if I, I bet you anything, there were birthdays in my adult life where literally no one got me anything and I didn't even notice, you know what I mean? It just doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't register for me. Like sure. I, I, I'm not, if any, it, uh, really, I would rather not have anyone get me any gifts, but you know, sometimes people are like, I just wanted to get this for you. You know, it's, it's your birthday right. or it's Christmas. And I'll be like, Oh, it's not. so I'm, I'm okay with it, but it just doesn't, it's just not really a thing that I think about anymore. But anyway, I, so it was, I think it was a birthday. I'm not quite sure. And you came over to my house for something, maybe for a podcasting and you had spent a lot of money on things. You got me a Beatles record. You also got me a pickle, a guitar pedal because, Oh yes. Because we had just done an episode on Pickle Rick. And it was like a pickle guitar pedal. Yeah, it was a guitar pedal called the Pickle or the pickle, something. Yeah. Because it was green and I don't yeah, know. Yeah. And you got me like something else. And I I remember, you know, I know how much guitar pedals cost. Like, let me look up the pickle guitar pedal. It's gotta be like a hundred I mean, bucks or something. It wasn't like a thousand or something. Pickle <laughs> guitar pedal. Um you know, not cheap. Uh, yeah, hundred and hundred and thirty bucks. Really? So, Jesus. Yeah. So I it was, was on like, sale. well, I'd sell for a hundred <laughs> bucks. So in my head, I'm like, one, like, wow, it's nice that you got me gifts, but but two, the Beatles record, okay, fine. Um, I don't have a record player, but you didn't you know, have, maybe, I didn't know you didn't have a vinyl player at the time because I assumed yeah, you did because yeah. you were like, you know, into music and I don't know, everyone I knew was a DJ. So it's like, you must have a record player. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was. I was a huge vinyl head back in the day, but right. uh, at some point I just purged everything, mainly because I just didn't want to carry it all anymore. But, um, and I'm starting to think about getting back into it <laughs> uh, and buying back all those records that I had. Oh, my goodness. Um, oh, man. But the pickle guitar pedal, I was like, you, are, you know that guitarist, because you're a guitarist, you don't just buy someone a pedal as a gift unless you know, like pedals are extremely personal, you know, like. See, I didn't know that actually. It, oh. and it's, it's, it's shocking probably, and maybe even to myself now, because I, I was never a gearhead in that sense. I was always a gearhead like with recording equipment. Yeah, you've never been a pedal, well, do you even have a guitar pedal? I do, I, but it was it was like, Sort of an afterthought when I had when I was a guitarist in my band. This is even before you and I played. I was like, all right, I guess I need a I need a pedal of some sort. Oh, so you know, goodness. I got like a big muff and I have a okay Ibanez of some sort. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I don't well, even know. To, to guitarists, <laughs> a pet, especially today, back in the day, like in the eighties and nineties when I was first playing guitar, there was only the few pedals that happened to be at Guitar Center, right? But now. There are so many boutique, really, really good boutique guitar sure. pedal makers, designers, that you can dial in the exact distortion or overdrive yeah. or phase or chorus or delay. I mean, you can get the exact thing you're looking for. And so, okay, so you didn't know, you actually thought, I'm going to get him this thing, and he's a guitarist, maybe he'll use it. That's what you thought? Well, there was that, and it was also like, um, 
I mean, it was a little irrational now that you tell me how much those pedals cost. But I was like, it's a pickle pedal. Ha! Yeah. I don't well, know. Well, so so here's my <laughs> here was my thought. And I don't know if we've talked about this, but here was my thought that was going through your mind. You're a very busy person, I think particularly back then. And, you know, pre-pandemic, you're commuting to work. You're, you know, oh, yeah. your, your kids, wife, family, work, you know, podcast. Like, you're just yeah. busy, busy, busy. And even just commuting to my house for to podcast, and you're like, oh crap! I it's his birthday. I gotta give him a gift. I gotta and, get him something. And you you went into Guitar Center or some kind of music shop. No, it was definitely and, Guitar Center. Okay, you went to Guitar Center, and you're just like, well, I'll find something for him here. And you have literally two and a half minutes to to shop, and so you're like, well, here's a Beatles record, and it was a Beatles record of of their live stuff i think it was anyway and then yeah you, and then you just oh pickle we've talked about pick you know the connection in your head was <laughs> we did an episode recently on pickle rick and here is something that says pickle a guitar pedal so i'm gonna buy it you know okay that'll be funny and that's just you literally gave it a half second thought you know and there was something else that you got as well and and you're like okay get in the car all right get, get to the house and in my head, after hearing you talk about this potential invisible loyalty, I wonder if there was some, some kind of panic or uh, uh, worry certainly. in your mind. No, I, I mean, there's certainly, I, that is literally what happened. I was like, oh man, I got to get him something. And I didn't make time for it. So I'll go to Guitar Center because, and, you know. And so, so to drill down on that, is there a part of you, irrationally or otherwise, that thought, oh crap, he's not going to like me? Or I'll disappoint well, I'm him. Sh I'm sure that was still there. Pro yeah, I'm sure. I, I don't... I, yeah, these things, as you know, are never like that literal, but I'm sure that was there. Like if you like showed if up empty-handed... I can't I, show up empty-handed. I would feel like, oh, bad friend. There was uh, and, and there was something, I, I think, compounding it, if I remember right. I think you're is, very guilt-driven often. <laughs> Pre-guilt-driven. Well, right, and, and there was something else compounding it, which is that, oh, man... He already thinks I'm disorganized. And so, like, if I don't get him something, it's going to be like, there goes Bardo, disorganized again. So, I'm like, I got to get him a gift. <laughs> I, wait, you think I think you're disorganized? <laughs> well, I, I, I thought at the time, you're like, oh, man, you know, he's late. He's like, he's just a hot mess. And this uh, just proves, pro confirms my expectation. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. And so, I was probably like, okay, shit, I got to go. And where can I go? Well, Guitar Center. He loves guitar stuff. So... And I, I went in, I'm like, okay, I'll get him a pedal. And then I'm like, ooh, they have a Beatles thing. Okay, great. Uh, and then as far as pedals, I don't know the first thing about pedals. So I'm like, I've, uh, oh, pickles. That We know pickles. <laughs> um, and I can tell you, I was pretty disappointed with your reaction because I was like, oh, man, he really didn't like this. <laughs> I was like, all right. Yeah, but, the, you it's, know, a I, it's a fuzz pedal. <laughs> And I'm sure it's, I, I actually didn't even um, plug it in. It might have been amazing. I, I think I just sold it back to Guitar Center at some point. <laughs> what a jerk. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, like, I already, ha I already have my overdrive and my, yeah. you know, I have my, uh, my. It's actually, it's funny. It's called an OCD pedal, which is yeah, uh, yeah, a little yeah. problematic. I'm and then I have familiar my, with um, the OCD. That's the, the one pedal everyone knows about, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, interesting. So I don't know if that answers your question, patron Leia slash Leah, but that's the answer we're going to give. When we get back from the break, Berto, let's do some OPPs. What do you say? Let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. Let's do some OPPs, Berto. OPP. So these people became patrons in October of 2019 and wow. have stayed patrons through thick and thin, Berto. To pandemic and thin. We got Mariana from Mendoza AR. What, what do you Whoa, think? A, Arizona? A, no, AR <laughs> country. Crunch, country code. <laughs> I'm always interested. Our, uh, wait, wait, Armenia. Uh, Argentina. You should know oh, that. Of course. I should have gone Argentina. Uh, oh, Mendoza? We, oh, come on. Christina on from, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. David from Gaza knows where. Eliza from St. Louis. Ooh. Cassia, Cassia from Vancouver, BC. Nice. Julia from Erie, Pennsylvania. Rivki Ooh. and Lisa from God knows where. Emily from Las Vegas. Deborah from Kenilworth, England, Great Britain. 
Thank you nice. for becoming patrons and staying patrons all of this time. Wait, we have a patron in Las Vegas? What? I know. Can you imagine if, like, you live in Las Vegas, this whole time you wouldn't have had to be saying, man, I can't go to Vegas because of the pandemic. Because you live in Vegas. <laughs> like well, my friend Jason, he lives in Vegas. He doesn't have to go to Vegas. He, he's there. I know, I met it. He owns a restaurant, doesn't he? Yeah, really nice Mal so, Malaysian. So, Berto, upper tier patron Jennifer from Jackson, Mississippi, said, you know, and that's another thing, like, Wait, we have a patron who lives in Jackson, Mississippi? During the pandemic, they're just in Jackson, Mississippi, Berto. Oh my gosh, you don't have to say, oh, I can't go to Jackson anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Up with your patron, Jennifer, says, Dr. Kirk and Umberto, have you, have you watched Squid Game? If so, how do y'all feel as it progressed? It was a riveting premise, but I feel guilty enjoying it. I know it's entertainment, but I can't shake the feeling that I'm a bad person for deriving pleasure from this show. Any comments, Berto, what do you think? So first of all, no spoilers because I've I'm only seen season one. Actually, I haven't even finished season one. I'm watching season one. Uh loving it. Uh I definitely don't feel any guilt because the whole thing is, as far as I read it, it is a um satirical uh look at our society. And um it's good to watch it and take lessons and ideas from it and thoughts because it is it is pointing fingers at a lot of bad things that we do as humans um it's only slightly exaggerating things um so from all those reasons I, I i don't think it's bad to watch it i think it's good to watch it now you might have a problem many people might have a problem with the violence it's certainly a violent show um and i do wonder what effect seeing lots of violent deaths actually has on our psyche in the long run but uh, i'm enjoying it well why do you think jennifer feels guilty for enjoying it well, there is the premise being like, hey, there's this game that you can play, and um, if you play the game, you can win money, but people will die in the process. Um, it's like our fascination with reality shows uh, when taken to the extreme. So maybe there's this idea like we're actually watching a show where people die, Well, do you, but it's not. It's, it's, you know, is it's the premise that draws you in to root for some people dying on the show? Sure, but that's true of, you know... How many shows are there that but, I mean, we're sitting there rooting for bad guys to die? And But you know, are there bad guys that... I mean, I I don't know. I haven't watched the show, spoiler alert. Oh, you haven't seen it? Okay. No. I, I, it's most of the TV, if it's just a straight-up series, I mm -hmm. watch with my wife because, yeah. you know, I don't really watch TV on my own. And so right. uh, we watched... I was like, well, we got to watch this, you know, and it was <laughs> really big. And I, I was... I'd heard some reviews of it and thought... Uh, I don't know if I'm going to like this thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think I would like it, Berto? I think so. It, at least what I've seen so far is really interesting. Okay. It's it's not what I thought it was going to be. It's it's a lot more of a harsh look at our society. Interesting. Well, so we start watching it, and it gets a, a little violent in the big, first episode. And Stacy was like, "I can't watch this. This is mm. too violent. <laughs> this is too violent." Yeah. And you know, it, there's it, something it about violent. Asian movie TV violence that's like. <laughs> over the top you it know is. And, and it's very so, matter of fact like blah. yeah <laughs> right so, so i i haven't watched it but um well i have to but I, well tell me berto do you ever wish you know that someone who isn't a bad person who or who definitely doesn't deserve to die as a viewer wish that they die in the show yeah i haven't gotten to that point maybe so far it's i mean I guess okay no no I see I see this point because the 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 truth is the, the most of the contestants uh, they haven't done anything that should be punished with death or anything like that so certainly if you're like rooting for one of them to do a little better so that they don't die well then you, that means you are kind of rooting for the other people who technically haven't done anything bad for them to die so yeah sure um, but it's not I don't know it's like. I don't feel it's kind of like when I play Grand Theft Auto. I don't, I don't actually feel bad. You know when I felt bad was uh, when I played Knights of the Old Republic many years ago, because that game lets you make choices that have consequences in the storyline, and you can betray your closest friend at one point in that game, and if you do, there's a whole you're, there's no turning back from that. Right. And oh my gosh, that actually, because I I did it and. 
I felt terrible. I was like, oh my gosh, am I a bad person? Like, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> so I know it's possible, but I don't know. I look at this one more like watching or like playing like a Grand Theft Auto where like, yeah, I, I should probably maybe feel a little bad, but it's just a game and this is just a show. The, the thing about the show that impresses me most isn't the, you know, oh, the crazy deaths and things. It's the, the social commentary. Mm -hmm. I think it is a worthy question to ask oneself is what am I feeling and why am I feeling that? And what do yeah. I think about that? Because when, when, you know, story writers, uh, filmmakers, TV show makers are making their thing, they're trying to uh, create an effect in the viewer. And right. sometimes that, like for instance, The Americans, which I love the TV show about Russian or Soviet spies living near Washington, D.C., who are trying to harm America. And, that would never happen. And they kill many Americans and, and sometimes extremely innocent people who were just like in the wrong place. You know, a janitor comes around the corner while they're doing a spy mission and they but are can't the protagonists of the show the russians yeah so you're kind of rooting for them yeah and you love them right. and they're and they're very likable right. characters and right. and you really respect them now there's another character who's an fbi agent who is trying to get them who also lives across the street and doesn't know it's them <laughs> oh and you also really care about him I see. So, you know, they, they show the FBI agents, the yeah. CIA agents, they show the the Russian spies, they show the American spies. And, you know, you kind of care about everyone in, in the You end. could feel guilty. if you, I mean, look, did but, you but, feel... But my point is, is that there are times when, I, you know, like when, like I said, the, the two spies are central characters, Philip and Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. They come around the corner and there's a janitor. I'm like, kill the janitor in my head. I'm like, yeah. well, get that. But that janitor could could have been my father. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. this is Americans. Like, and they're <laughs> they're just they're trying to you know get information on. But we you know, advance on, the plot. <laughs> yeah, on the new nuclear bomb or something, United States yeah. or stealth technology, and and I I have this this i'm like okay thank god they killed him and then but you have to say to yourself <laughs> because, because that's because of course right. that's what the show but then you have to stop and say well wait a second <laughs> like hold on they are psychopathic killers rampaging through the united <laughs> states killing people because their government is paying them now you would also say well if it wasn't them it'd be someone else you know it's it's not like they woke up in the morning and say i'm going to kill people <laughs> it's like part of the system it doesn't make it okay of course but it, but it it is something to ask yourself you know because i think on one hand we should just enter, entertain you know just watch entertainment but on the other hand i think we should watch out for being uh, influence in a way that it can actually make us into horrible human beings, which I think happens sometimes. Yeah, so let, let me ask you two questions. First, how many days did you cry after you watched Star Wars for the first time, realizing how many relatively innocent Empire janitors and plumbers died when the Death Star blew up? Were oh, you, did you it was rough. Counseling? I mean, I was six years old at the time, yeah. or five or whatever, and... Yeah. Oh, that's all yeah, I right? thought about. I'm still traumatized by it. Yeah. And then the second question I have is, how does it feel in Age of Empires 4 when you run into a town with your horse or horses and your <laughs> pikemen and stuff, and you're burning buildings and all that? And yeah, yeah. Especially, <laughs> so if you don't know, Berto and I are obsessed <laughs> with this real-time strategy computer game that we play frequently with uh, Berto and his, and his brother. And and especially because you play these different historical civilizations, mm -hmm. I'm often playing the British because they're the easiest civ to play because I, I don't really understand the game that well. And <laughs> you're actually I'm, really good now. <laughs> and, and I'm I'm invading like um, <laughs> like Indian uh, cultures, right? And just mowing down a bunch of Indian people, and I'm the British. Yeah, you know. So there are. <laughs> <laughs> there are problems with this. And yet but, you sleep um, like a baby. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, totally. I'm not, I'm not saying that you're supposed to, like, take it seriously. But I think it, 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 it does justify reflection. It does justify, like, do I think you should feel like you're a bad person? Right. Um, I, probably not. But 
do I think you should ask the question like, hmm, what is the, what is the story tr trying to make me feel? Mm -hmm. And do, how do I feel about that? You know, just a little bit of a question mark because when the propaganda gets under your skin, it's there to stay. So yeah. sometimes, uh, so Berto, I finally, uh, we got some, um, holiday cards in the mail. Ooh. Uh, by the way, if you want to send us cards or anything, you can send it to box 214-10002. That's three zeros, 10002. Aurora Avenue North, Suite 36, Seattle, Washington, 98133. That's where Berto lives. Just joking. <laughs> so this first card is, I'm opening it now. It has a very difficult um, envelope. Uh, uh, fast podcasting dead space bad um, from annual patron Andre from Canada uh, you have brought so much to my life in the last two years I'm grateful oh, that's Aww. great happy holidays Merry Christmas and then this one is a Snoopy card oh I love Snoopy especially around the holidays from Jennifer wait we didn't we just have a Jennifer was Did there we, a Jennifer patron? From Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah, you even made a joke Oh, no, this is... Jackson. This is... Well, wait. Hold on. Is this the the same person? The same Jennifer. <gasps> so I have the... the dun, um, dun, dun. I'm going to... I'm going to look it up here. I'm not going to say the town that she's from, but if it's near Jacksonville or Jackson... It is. Oh, my God. It's the same... Same yeah, I person. I mean, we have two... Boy, my. <laughs> Jennifer's from that from Jackson because the what? the little neighborhood that she gave us is like a part of Jackson. Isn't oh, that wow. coincidental? Uh, thank you for another year of excellent content. We we content we appreciate you and those who help you make insightful and be amusing videos and podcasts. Aww. Most sincerely, Jennifer. Amused oh. indeed. That is bizarre that we read yeah, that her is email. Pretty coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> All right, patron Natasha from California. Good old Natasha, who hey, we've Natasha. met in person. I'm partway through the Get Back episode of yours and about Beatles. Partway? It's only four hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, well, the documentary is eight and a half hours, so what are you going to yeah. do? <laughs> and while I agree that Yoko has some annoying mannerisms, I don't think it can be ignored. Ah! <laughs> oh, my God. You're... Um, your uh, <laughs> compression kicked you off the channel. Did you know that? Oh, if you scream, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it'll like turn. It turned you off. It sounded really weird. Um, I don't think it can be ignored that Yoko was an abuse victim throughout her relationship with John. I'm uncomfortable throwing so much shade at a victim of a guy everyone idolizes. I imagine she was quite afraid of him at times, maybe especially in social settings where everyone was on his side. I mentioned, I mentioned in a previous email that I was a huge Beatles fan as a kid. Posters, CDs, T-shirts, books detailing the minutiae of their lives watched across the universe a million times. But I really can't listen to John's songs now and, and not feel some disgust in light of his apparent hypocrisy when preaching peace. Berto, what do you think? Yeah, we talked about this before. Um, like we did is... a whole deep dive on John. Yeah. And, and talked about the uh, very possible massive amounts of abuse that he committed upon Yoko. Oh man, yeah, I know. It's it's this is one and of the others his, and his first wife, you know, he and in his songs, you know, he talks about you better run for your life, little girl, catch you with another man. That's the that's end. the end of little girl. little girl. Yeah, was oh, that what he says? That's the end of little girl. Yep. Oh, I always thought it was, that's the end, uh, little girl. I thought yep. it was end uh, with, yeah, that, with, no, that's with the a end, comma. Uh, little end girl. It's a clever double meaning right there. I guess that's true. That would be very yeah. John, right? Yeah, that's very John. Yeah. Listen, it is troubling and it is difficult and it is never easy with these things because we know other artists that we love and have weird stuff and some very bad stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was thinking about that while we were watching it. Because he comes off very nice. In fact, very uh, muted and almost 
you know, quieted in in the documentary until he kind of perks up. And but you you just never know. Yeah. So going on the assumption, which is a pretty good one to make, that he was abusive not only to Yoko but to uh, Cynthia as well, his his first wife. That is wrong. It's not okay. Now we look at his history and we see a history of someone that is that's you know commonly um, ha- struggling emotionally and sometimes with that behavior. He was essentially without parents from the age of zero to five or something, and then um, you know shunted off to his aunt who was there for him. His aunt and uncle were there for him, but they weren't like there for them, there for him, there for him. You know what I mean? And then his mom has um, a whole other family just down the street and John can't go to see his mom. You know, it's like just the right. amount of betrayal and harm and so abandonment. the ingredients were there. Yeah. And, and so emotional regulation is going to be a problem. Uh, identifying with the abuser, feeling entitled, uh, you know, lots of things can happen out of that petri dish. What, what, if you what has Yoko said? Like, has she actually... I don't know. I mean, I remember in our deep dive, I'd have to look in my yeah. notes, but I think she has talked about it. But at the very least, we, we could pretty much assume that some yeah. bad things were happening. Now, I don't know, like, well, the other woman, what was her name? My Pei or what, what, the, the woman that he was with in between Yoko stints, you know? When he went to yeah. L.A., it had like the lost I, year or something. Right, with, right, right. Uh, I forget the name, though. With uh, Nielsen or whatever the guy's was. Um, she talked about how John uh, was upset with her and just flew into a rage, like jumped across yeah. the table and tried to strangle her to death. And people had to take, they had to pull John off of her, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I I get it, Natasha, if for you listening to John is you know you just can't do it or when you do it's like really gross when you think about what he did and 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 the and the hypocrisy right uh how he talked about peace but but i think it's um like for me i'll just and i think everyone's on their own journey and i i i really loathe the fact that in today's twitter world there's like a right way to react to this and there's a wrong way to react, you know? And I don't feel like we're that way with John, of course, because I don't think a lot of people care these days, but we do have this reaction to say like Woody Allen or Michael Jackson or something. You know, there's a certain like imposition, I think. And I, th- I think it's an important conversation to have, but the reason why I say this is because I worry that somehow I'm going to get canceled if I say I listen to John Lennon's music having <laughs> knowledge of the fact that he was abused. You know what I mean, Berto? Well, yes, but... Yes, but like what's weird, it, it, both in the Michael Jackson and Woody Allen cases, both of whom I'm personally convinced that they did bad stuff, but there's technically no conviction there, so it's weird. It's like I've had some people so angry, so angry that I bought into the documentary of uh, Woody Allen, you know, and I'm like, well, I don't know, I'm. It just sounds pretty convincing to me, but really, well, I, I didn't yeah. know there were adamant Woody Allen defenders. Yeah. I mean, oh, we absolutely. know there are Michael Jackson defenders, yeah. but, but I no, know. I, like, and and the thing is, the the only leg that someone would have to stand on, but it's a real leg, is like, look, you're you're making you know you're you're making an assumption based on zero convictions. It's like, okay, fine, fair enough. That said, for me personally, I still decide that I believe the accusers you know I, I could be wrong but that's just my decision and yeah, even I, with all that i still struggle about the art yeah i really don't understand i mean i i get the data point of conviction versus non not conviction yeah but we all understand that sexual abuse or you know abuse victims they don't come forward and when they do yeah. the you know statute of limitations or something is in place so that it protects them yeah. So, you know, the fact that, say, Harvey Weinstein, was Harvey Weinstein a good person before he was convicted? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? What, was he completely yeah. just free to do, you know, and, and yeah. hating, hating him would be this horrible act? That's right. No, that's ridiculous. That's, <laughs> that's requiring our society to be different. That's requiring us, that's putting all of our eggs in 
the court basket. On the other hand, someone gets convicted of something that they didn't, you know, like a police officer de- deems it necessary to shoot someone. Do we? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, the authorities have spoken, you know, they deserve right. to be shot. Like we understand that, that institutions like the law and courts and these are human institutions filled with bias and imperfection. So putting all your now as a data point, you know, for sure, like if I don't know much about a situation and I hear about someone not being convicted, you know, they, they went to court, all the data was presented, presumably, and a jury decided that there wasn't enough to convict, then even though on the outside, I might be like, well, you know, it looks like there was a lot of evidence that, you know, the Michael Jackson case, you could argue actually has that data point on the other side because right. they did go to court and he was exonerated. Um, hey, so OJ Simpson, you know. Right, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, I get it, but I don't get the putting all your eggs in that basket. And I think it cuts both ways, meaning um, it's okay for someone to feel really angry at these people and not want to patronize them anymore. It's also okay for someone to have doubts and think, I don't know, I I just, the data is inconclusive. I still, you know, I think it's also okay to, even if you are on either side, to have doubts whether you want to patronize their their art still. what and it's still also okay to give our opinions to one another where i think the the line is drawn for me is uh when when people become belligerent or even to the point of threatening you know and stuff like that it's like well no you know now you're being as bad as the people you think you're defending or accusing you know and also um there's ultimately no way for any of us to know things you know because Anything that's been proven in court, as you point out, can be false too. So it's not like there's some infallible way for us to know the truth. But, it, you know, we have to operate in our lives in some way. So I personally, I look at like the data around me. And if it feels fairly convincing, I, I try to, you know, I try to act on that. With yeah. some of these cases, uh, like the Harvey Weinstein, it becomes pretty easy. Like if, for me, that is, if, if I... If someone's like, hey, uh, do you want to support the Harvey Weinstein Defend Fund? It, it's an easy no for me. It's like, no, absolutely not. Um, whereas something like Michael Jackson is like, hey, do you want to like, do you want to buy one of his records? No, I don't want to buy one of his records. Are you going to turn off the radio because one of his songs came on? Probably not. And that's just me. And so I'm, I'm still conflicted in, in those cases. Yeah. So, Natasha, getting to, I think, your central point is you know, when we were talking about Get Back, uh, we didn't really, because there was, you know, we went into a lot, we went down a lot of roads of discussion in our three and a half hour talk, but, you know, we didn't, I think, again, go down the road of the abuse that Yoko went through. It's unknown how much the abuse was occurring at that point, you, you know, because John and Yoko were a new couple. So I, I don't know if we know if it was already happening. It could have been. The other thing is that, um, for me, this is this is my story, is that if John had lived long, because he was already redeeming himself. Um, actually, Berto and I are working on a deep dive on John Lennon and, and his death. Uh, so I've recently been absorbing a lot of John Lennon from 1975 to 1980, uh, the past week, and it's, I, he was totally on a healthy path, seemingly. He was, uh, he had spent, he, he had spent 1975 to 1980 kind of recharging his battery for the first time in his life. It was the first time in his life where he really just slowed down and said, I want to figure out who I am. I don't want to, it was actually kind of um, a news story about how John Lennon had become totally divorced from the spotlight, you know, mm-hmm. and because he, he was such a humongous figure from 1964 until 1975 and then suddenly he's not recording he's no longer doing interviews he was worried that the u.s government was going to deport him from new york city and and so he was kind of laying low because of that supposedly and he was dedicating himself to being a a father of sean presumably to be a husband to yoko and i believe that john who knows if he lived another 20 30 years i think he would have given his personality, apologized, I think, because he wasn't afraid of answering questions, honestly. And I think that, I think people would have, because you got to think about the times, and this is 70s, man. Like, 
the 70s in the United States was like uh, just a whole other universe culturally, especially when it came to abuse, especially women yeah. and, sec and sexism and stuff like. So it's possible that with that, you know, the Me Too movement, I could see him marching for the Me Too movement. Absolutely. I could see him yeah. writing music about, I could see him writing a, a, a companion or a response song to Catch, you know, uh, uh, what's the song called? Catch me, um, catch you with Little another girl, man. Uh, uh, what's the name of the song? <laughs> run if you can. Uh, yeah, run. You better uh, run, little yeah. run, little girl. I think. Run anyway, oh, um, oh, by the way, uh, I, that is one thing that I do disagree with is that um, I don't think he was ever duplicitous in that sense. Like he actually was pretty transparent in the songs. Like, yeah, t even to a bad extent. Like his songs. Did not come off flattering for him when you actually read the lyrics. Like, well, he, but did he? But did he mean it as a as a way of outing himself, or did he say, "No, this is just how I am, and this is okay"? You know what I mean? Was it a coded way of saying, "I agree that terrorizing women is actually normal"? No, no, no. I think in his early twenties, because you know he's early twenties writing some of these songs, very early. Um, he didn't know. He 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 was just being honest, right? And he didn't realize how horrific the lyrics are, and also culturally, at the time, th let's remember that song was published and went on the charts, and people bought it and loved it. I loved it. Yeah. It, I it, that those lyrics didn't even register to me as a problem. Well, it, it didn't with me until I knew that he was abusive, because I just thought it was a metaphor. You know, I guess it's pretty clear as day once you listen. I to don't it. think so. I I think that <laughs> there there are so many metaphors in songs that you know, at rap music, for example, uh, similarly, where people are saying things that if you took it literally, you know, Maxwell Silverhammer, do we really believe that Paul wants a kid to kill people for annoying him? Like, no, it's it's metaphor. We uh, lyrics are very frequently highly metaphoric and and you know there are songs about like um about obsession and about stalking women but but especially back then i'd rather see you dead little girl than to be with another man I, uh, even I, if it's metaphor those yeah. lyrics are very violent towards women yeah no no right I, it, of course 100 percent. Right. so i'm saying that but it but i never even it never even registered forget but i, like bet, you, or but I bet you there are thousands of other songs in the exact same mode by other popular bands that if we just searched that were Absolutely. not but that, that is not, my point but that were but that were not written by abusive men that were just they were just you know expressions of how they felt about things yeah but i'm not but i wasn't i'm not debating that point I, all i'm saying is like he i don't think he was ever duplicitous like he, he okay where were the songs about like Women should be treated like a flower and never harmed. Those songs don't exist. Yeah. The songs are either just like, ooh, baby, you know, hold my hand, or I'm going to kill you because I'm <laughs> jealous. And then later when he became more self-aware, he, he literally said, I'm a jealous guy, right? Right, right, right. right. So I, I'm not saying he was a nice guy. I don't know all the story. I, he probably was abusive and it's probably fine if you don't want to patronize him anymore as a result. But I just don't think he was ever like singing songs about how non-abusive he was. Do you think that he would have come around if he lived another 30 years? I imagine so, because uh, first of all, he he was much older. You know, when he died, he was entering his 40s, you know, he, right? It was after yeah, his he was 40 when he died, yeah. Yeah. And um, he was still with Yoko, and he was trying to make a, an actual, an actual concerted effort with that. And um, he seemed more at peace with himself. And I don't know, but I yeah. hope so. I hope yeah. so. Also, a big thing, Natasha, for me is that Yoko seems to have reckoned with that history, and so for her, she still speaks. You know. Uh, reverent really about him she still respects him she still advocates for him and who knows maybe that's just more victim mentality but i think that the overall gestalt of the relationship between the two of them was um was good in her eyes 
I, I don't know that. I'm sure it's more complicated. Than that. I haven't read any bi. Do you have your read any biographies by Yoko Ono? <laughs> no, not by Yoko Ono. Yeah, that's why I was asking earlier. Like, does what does Yoko say? Because I'm not, I've not seen it. Right, I, I'm not seeing her denouncing what actually happened, and it's you know who knows. <laughs> but along these lines, just to nerd out, just with one more question, Berto. So you know Yoko in Get Back, the film footage, she's either extremely quiet, just like a lump. Yeah. I, I think we might have called her a lump on an amp or something. <laughs> and or, or she's screaming in a microphone, just annoying everything right. about sound and music. Um, and and if she only did that once or twice, the screaming, as I said in the in our episode, I would have been told totally, I would have been like, that's kind of fun. But that's all she does. She does it over and over and over again. Like it's it's she's just a one note screamathon. Anyway, um, so uh, do you think that her demeanor in the footage, being quiet and non imposing, non assertive, had something to do with her having been beaten down by John Lennon already? I uh, I didn't interpret it that way because. Um, I sort of got the sense because when when we were observing that, John was also super quiet and pulled back. So it's quite possible that they were both on drugs. <laughs> um, it's also possible that they were both kind of checked out, especially you know John's checked out and Yoko's checked out as in like, well, I'm here with him, but I don't even know why we're here. So it's I think it'd be really speculative to say, well, he, she's quiet because he's beating her because he was quiet too. Yeah. Um, he didn't come alive till much later in the documentary when, and when he does, like, she's engaged too, you know? Yeah. That is when she starts getting on the mic and screaming. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the in the interviews that I've seen where the two of them are together, John is talking a lot, which he, you know, tends to do. And, but when Yoko starts to speak, he often interrupts her. And I, f I find that annoying to me sometimes. Like, do you that's that? totally fair. Now, that said, uh, Linda McCartney was in the documentary. She said probably like zero words, maybe. And was she being abused by Paul? No. Not that right. we know of, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Paul killed Linda. Let's start that rumor. Yes, yes. Paul is Are dead and killed Linda. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Birdo. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>